Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Eloise Gomez Reyes. I'm the Assembly Majority Leader representing the 47th Assembly District. My district includes the communities of Fontana, Colton, Grand Terrace, Rialto, San Bernardino, and the unincorporated communities of Bloomington and Muscoy. I'm really excited about having all of you here with us, and I'm so excited about the panelists who are joining us. But I'm most excited about those who are co-hosting with me uh, for this Facebook Live Town Hall that we're having with you. Um, with me to co-host are Senator Connie Leva and Supervisor Joe Baca Jr. Welcome, Senator. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. It is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining me and uh, having us. And thank you to everyone who is on our panel. I'm very excited to hear from all of you and what you have to say. And hopefully we can enlighten folks. I know that the vaccine rollout has been a little bumpy and a little rocky, but I think we continue to get better. I know there's some frustration out there. I have felt that frustration when I was trying to get my parents vaccinated who are 74 and I was finally able to get them on a list at a drugstore and they called them when they were uh, had some vaccines that people didn't show up for. But we're getting better every day and we now have Blue Shield who is going to help us roll out the vaccines as well. So happy to be here, excited to hear from our experts and always make sure you call us if you have any questions. Thank you, Madam Majority Leader. And now I would love to turn it over to newly elected Supervisor Joe Baca Jr. Thank you, uh, Senator Leva. And I wanna thank uh, our Senator Leva and Assembly Member Reyes for hosting or co-hosting this event and, and bringing the panelists together. And I know there's been a lot of these town halls and I think they're all good. I think the more we could do, the more we could share information with the public. I mean, I think that's great. Um, there's so much occurring about COVID-19 vaccination, you know, many details and information continues to change. But let me just share some of the things the County of San Bernardino's done is we adopted the equity as the 11th element as a countywide vision. So one of the things we really have been committed to is in line with the commission, the importance of distributing COVID-19 vaccine is equity amongst Latino, Black and other communities which have been hit the hardest by the virus. And some of the things we've been able to do is have some mobile pop-up vaccination sites and actually personally had a chance to visit a few and just seeing the reactions of families and watching how they've been uh, inoculated and how they get to see family members and loved ones. And I think this is great information. I think the panelists have a lot of good information to share to us. And it's really getting our communities to get past the fear and, and really get uh, the opportunity to get vaccinated. The challenges is having enough vaccines and uh, we just got to continue to encourage people to stay safe, get vaccinated and uh, continue to um, have safe practices. But I want to thank uh, the co-hosts uh, for hosting this event and uh, looking forward to hearing the panelists. So thank you all for having us here today. Thank you. And, you know, something, Supervisor, that is so important to you and Senator have talked about is that in the end, we're all in this together. We want to see our communities uh, immunized. We want everybody to get the, the, the vaccine that wants the vaccine. And we're all going to work together to make sure that things do happen for our community. I, I want to thank everyone who's joining us, but, but I also want to introduce you all to our special guests. Uh, with us, we have the San Bernardino County Public Health Director, Corwin Porter. We also have the Assistant Director, Josh Dugas. Uh, we also have from Arrowhead Regional Medical Center, the Chief Operating Officer, Andrew Goldfreck. And we also have Dr. Sharon Wong, Chief of Infectious Disease at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. And before we start, I do want to set some expectations for the call. Uh, we are going to hear some brief introductions and introductory comments, um, and opening comments from our panelists. And then we're going to follow with a series of questions. I want you to, to know that we have been collecting questions for the past several days from the community. Um, we've received some wonderful questions regarding the vaccines, public health, and other related areas. We're going to try to get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. Uh, even if we don't get to your question or if you think of a new question, do get it to us. We'll try to get the answer for you. If not today, we'll get it back, get it to you in the next few days. Uh, my staff will put my email in the chat box 
assemblymember.reyes at assembly.ca.gov. So before I turn it over to our panelists, I do want to share some of what Senator Leva and I have been doing at the state, at the state level. We do know that as of now, the state of Cal through the state of California, we have administered over seven and a half million doses. That's a big deal. I can tell you that in just the last four weeks, we've seen vaccine administration rise from one million doses to where we are today at seven and a half million. The state has ex executed, as Senator Leva mentioned, the third party uh, contract with Blue Shield, and they're currently engaging with some of the counties to develop a statewide network that prioritizes equity and doing no harm. And I appreciate that uh, Supervisor Baca has talked about the issue of equity. And I know that our panelists will be talking about that as well. The equity framework focuses on the hard to reach and populations disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And the goal is to get vaccines to those who need them the most and as quickly and as efficiently as possible. I know that one of the issues, as the Senator has mentioned, is the supply. And mm. we're hoping to reach a capacity of administering 2 million doses per week. And we hope to do this by next week. I, in my position as majority leader, I do receive regular briefing, briefings each week from the state officials on the progress of the distribution. And I've been very pleased to see the recent progress, including the rollout of the My Turn website. And again, our panelists will be sharing some of this information with us. And now we're going to turn to our distinguished guests, our panelists. Uh, we want to begin by uh, with an update on COVID-19 from San Bernardino County Public Health Director, Corwin Porter. Director Porter has worked for public health for 31 years, currently holding the position of director for the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health. He was previously the assistant director of, De of the Department of Public Health for almost five years with oversight over four divisions and three programs. Prior to this, he served as a director of environmental health services for four years. While in this position, he served on the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health Executive Committee for three years. Director Porter. Thank you so much, Assembly Member. It's my pleasure to be with everyone today. I've got a few slides that I'd like to show and, and review with you. Uh, got good news today, and so I'm going to jump into that in just a moment. I'm hoping the slides are now visible so that everyone can see those and follow along. But uh, what I'd like to share with you is some of the uh, response that the county has been involved in and it's still going on. So I'm gonna list a couple things real quickly and just share a few uh, comments about each one. We still continue to look after our senior living facilities, our skilled nursing facilities. We have a task force that visits them regularly and checks in on them. Good news is we've seen reduction in cases in those facilities and reduction in deaths in that population. So very good news to report there. We have a school task force that's been working closely with the schools to help them prepare for reopening. We're excited to see many of the K through six schools already begin to open now that our case rates have descended below 25. So that's good news. We're looking forward to high schools opening soon as well. We have a dashboard that we keep updated regularly. A recent addition is a vaccination tab. And I'll defer any more comments on vaccine because uh, we have a, a panelist that will be speaking specifically about that in just a few minutes. We have a contact tracing and investigation team that continues to try to help positive, identify positive COVID cases and get them into isolation and quarantine to reduce the spread of the virus. We have a whole group of folks countywide and partners countywide doing testing to continue to identify COVID virus and again, then work with our contact tracing team to get those folks isolated. We have a whole team that works on just messaging and communication aspects to make sure the information flows and gets out to folks. We have a vaccine task force, as I mentioned already, and you'll hear more, hear more about that in just a few minutes. We also have regular calls. There's so much information that changes regularly, so many uh, different groups that uh, are interested and need to hear information, so we have regular calls. Uh, next slide, please. 
So now I wanna talk about some good news. So the case rates in our county have been decreasing for the last several weeks. So has our positivity rates, which is very good news. Our hospitalizations and our ICU capacity and the surge capacity has also seen improvement. So we're very happy to report that as well. We're actually projecting that if we stay on our current trajectory, that by the latter part of March, this county should qualify to be in the red tier. So more to come on that as we track our progress weekly. Next slide, please. So before I go into the specific data for our county, I just want to remind folks what we are referring to when we talk about the purple, the red, the orange, and the yellow tier. So currently the county is in the purple tier because our cases are more than seven per 100,000. Our positivity, however, actually meets the red tier, and I'll show you those numbers in a moment. So we are at between that five and 8% range on positivity. So good news, we're making progress. Next slide, please. So here is where we currently stand. Our county is in the purple tier. And the reason we're in the purple tier is because our case rate is just below 13. We're coming in at 12.8 cases per 100,000. Huge improvement over just a few weeks ago. But in order to get to the red tier, we have to be able to get to that seven cases per 100,000. And we're getting closer every day. So we're happy about that, but more work to do. Where we have already met is that positivity I just referenced. The overall positivity for the county is at 5.6%. So that meets the red tier criteria. Good news also that our equity positivity, when we look at the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in our county, that positivity is a 6.6%. So good news there as well. Where we're challenged a little bit is in our testing rate. Our testing rate was much, much higher a few weeks ago. It is currently at 371. We would love for that to be higher. So we're encouraging folks to still get tested. There's still a need for testing for identifying those positive cases in the community and slowing the spread of the virus. I mentioned in passing that once our case rate gets below 25, K through six can open. So that has already occurred. Now, one more trigger that we're watching closely is youth sports. Many of you may have heard that uh, things such as football could begin once the case rate descends below 14. We're anticipating the state making that announcement early next week and to officially allow all those activities that might normally have to wait for the red or the orange tier that are a high risk or mo moderate risk uh, outdoor to be able to actually occur in the purple tier. So we're hoping that announcement will be made next week. And I know a lot of folks are excited about that. And then our next trigger that we're really looking for is to get to that seven case mark where more businesses more things can resume in our county. So thank you for allowing me to do this update today. It's been my pleasure. Uh, next slide. Thank you so much, uh, Director Porter. That was a great update. And it's always nice to hear some positive news. It's been a long year. I like to say to people, we have light at the end of the tunnel and it's not a train. So thank you for providing us with some positive updates. Next, we'd like to hear from Arrowhead Regional Medical Center Chief Operating Officer, Andrew Goldfrack, with an update on the vaccine distribution. Please go right ahead. Thank you very much, Senator. And it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about our, our vaccination update and uh, how we're rolling out vaccinations across the county. Uh, next slide, please. So the county follows very closely the phasing guidelines that have been set forth through the California Department of Public Health. And I know there's been a lot of conversations and collaboration between the CDPH as well as the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We really focus our rollout on the balance on equity and focusing on the prevention of morbidity and mortality, as well as the preservation of societal functioning. Our website, which is sbcovid19.com slash vaccine, provides a, a really detailed outline of the different phasing guidelines, what different industries are within which phase, 
as well as where we are today. On the next slide, uh, we'll, we'll talk through where we are. So we have been very successful through our initial phase 1A, which is all the healthcare workers. And we are currently in phase 1B, tier one, which today include our emergency services, our education, and those 65 and older. Starting on, on March 15th, that tier will expand to those under 65 with high risk comorbid conditions um, that has been uh, deemed uh, appropriate by a healthcare provider. Before we move into um, our distribution model, which Josh Dugas will, will talk through, I did want to spend a, a few minutes and just uh, discuss in terms of numbers how we've been uh, successful in uh, rolling out our, our vaccinations. When we look at the allocation that comes to the county from the state, we measure our, our, uh, our success in terms of utilization. So in terms of raw numbers, we've been successful in able to, to vaccinate over 333 residents of San Bernardino County. When we look at the first dose or that, that very first shot that individuals receive, we are in the ballpark of 95 to 97% utilized, meaning the doses that come to the county are in arms within seven days of when we receive them. Um, we have a, a network, which, which Josh will talk about in a few moments of all of the different providers that are working tirelessly across the county. And one of the things that I'm very proud of is that public private partnerships that we've been able to develop and really been able to foster because we've all see the greater good. And we, you know, we have the tagline SB County together, but it's not just a tagline. It really is the way we are operating. Um, so with that, I will conclude my initial part of the presentation um, as we move on to the next slide where um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll go uh, introduce uh, Josh from there. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Goldfrack, for that uh, presentation and update. And I know one of the things that uh, wasn't shared, but, uh, you know, the death rate of seniors early on is that's why they became a target audience. And I know it's been frustrating for many others uh, to get the vaccine. And I know as soon as the vaccine's available, the job of the county has been to get it out. You know, we put up senior mobile sites throughout the county. Um, so that's been helping getting it out. But I appreciate it, Mr. Goldfrack. And uh, next, uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, the Assistant Director, Josh Dugas, on vaccina uh, vaccination sites. Uh, Mr. Dugas has worked for public health for close to 20 years and currently holding the position of Assistant Director for the San Bernardino County Department of Public Health, DPH. He was previously the chief financial officer for two years. Uh, prior to this, he served as the director of environmental health, EHS, for three years. And while in that position, he served as the California Conference of Directors of Environmental Health, CCDEH, executive committee for years. And uh, thank you, Mr. Dugas. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much, Supervisor Baca. Uh, so, uh, I'm lucky enough to talk about the question we probably get the most often, where can I get vaccinated? So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. You know, as Mr. Goldfrack alluded to, we've, uh, we've done a lot of partnership, but as you can see from these numbers, uh, the county is running seven sites that are um, you know, larger sites that, that have the capacity between anywhere from 300 to 1,000 doses a day administered. Uh, we have a couple state sites that are operating in our county. And if you look at that other number, that's the one we're actually really, really, really proud of. We have 245 partners uh, throughout our county that are also uh, helping us provide uh, vaccines to our residents. Um, next slide, please. And looking at this, you can see with our um, MPODs or medical point of dispensing sites, uh, we have those spaced out throughout the county to try to reach as many of our residents as possible. Uh, you know, the state sites, we have one located in Bloomington and another one in Ukaipa. And then our approved providers. So those include uh, just about every hospital in our, in our, in our county. We have uh, close to 100 pharmacies that are on board. And uh, we have you know, a, a whole lot of physician practices. And, and this makes it really convenient when people are looking for appointments. Uh, but if you go on our website, you can hopefully find something that's really close to your house. And as Supervisor Baca alluded to, we've also started 
uh, doing mobile pop-up clinics, and we're trying to target those in areas that are harder to reach, um, more equity-based, um, in an effort to, uh, to get out to people that may not always have the opportunity to get out to one of these sites. Uh, so again, if you're looking for an appointment, please visit our website, sbcovid19.com backslash vaccine. And we have, um, you know, that we have links to not just our sites, but also our partners on there as well. So you can hopefully find a, a, an appointment time to get a vaccine. Um, next slide, please. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the changes that you'll be seeing to the uh, vaccine rollout, both Assembly Member Reyes and, and, and Senator Leva have mentioned some of these, but uh, Blue Shield will be taking the lead as a third party administrator to help facilitate uh, you know, distribution of vaccine throughout our county. The county will be transitioning. We've already started transitioning to the uh, My Turn system, which is a, a wonderful uh, way to register, not only to find an appointment to receive your vaccine, but to register and receive notifications of when uh, vaccines are available or when the tier that you fall under may open up so that you can receive, uh, receive your vaccine. And then again, uh, Mr. Goldfrack alluded to the beginning March 15th, state will open vaccinations to uh, people 16 to 64 who are deemed uh, very high risk for, um, for certain medical conditions. Um, so you know, we'll watch out for that also. Um, next slide, please. And to close, I'd be remiss if I didn't please encourage everyone though, you know, Mr. Porter gave a lot of uh, reassuring news and our numbers are improving. Please continue to wash your hands, cover your face, socially distance and, uh, and stay home if you're sick and, uh, and hopefully we'll continue to progress um, towards, uh, towards a better time. So um, again, if there's ever anything you need regarding appointments or have questions, we have our website, sbcovid19.com. And you can also call our Joint Information Center um, at 909-387-3911. That phone, um, phone number also offers an opportunity for those who don't have um, internet access or aren't comfortable registering for their appointment through a computer to uh, speak to someone and they'll be happy to help you register for an appointment. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mr. Dugas. I sincerely appreciate the, the information that you're providing. It's always good to know, even though many of us on this, uh, on this call, on this Zoom, receive the updates, it is so important that everybody get the updates, that everybody know where we're going uh, and what to expect next. So thank you so much. Uh, next, we're going to hear uh, from our final uh, panelist, Dr. Sharon Wang. Chief of Infectious Diseases at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. She is the co-director for ARMC Antibiotic Stewardship Program, a medical director for ARMC Employee Health and chair of Infectious Control Committee. She has an osteopathic medical degree and a master's in health profession education. She's worked in private practice for two years uh, before joining the medical staff here at AR ARMC in 2015 and was the ARMC 2020 Physician of the Year. Her passion is fighting the good fight to end this pandemic. Dr. Wang, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. I'm here to give you some facts about the vaccine and also um, to address some of your concern and hesitancy. So, who is affected by COVID-19? And as you alluded earlier, um, the Latino population is disproportionately affected. And you can see that the Latino population accounted for 50% of the cases and um, around 50% of the deaths. So um, equality is very important when it comes to any health um, measure rollout. So um, I just wanna showcase that next. And you can see if we just look at the absolute number or the risk, um, the, the risk of a Latino person getting hospitalized is three times higher than a, 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 a white counterpart. And same thing, the death is higher as well. Next. So what are some of the tools that we can have to get through the pandemic safely? We talked about all the public health measures last year and um, all the, all the hand, hand washing, social distancing, um, but now we're given another tool to keep you safe while we fight this and get through the pandemic. So let's talk about the vaccine. That's why I'm here. Um, what's available to us? What's on the menu? 
Currently, we have the two that are FDA approved under emergency authorization use, and you hear about this, is the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Both are two scheduled doses. Um, the difference between the two is Pfizer's approved for individuals 16 and up and Moderna is 18 and up. And our, the next contender is the Johnson & Johnson. So hopefully that will get approved um, by the end of the week or early next week, and that's a single dose. Um, there are actually over 70 vaccine trials going on right now. So um, they will be more coming out in the future, but right now we have the two and hopefully the third one um, soon. Next. So a lot of the people ask me, how can a COVID-19, how can a vaccine be developed in under just one year? Um, most of the vaccines, most of the drug take years to, um, to before it becomes available to us. Um, the, the truth is the, this technology, the mRNA vaccine technology is not new to us. It's been studied in developing vaccines against other infections such as the Ebola, the Zika virus, influenza, and it's also been studied in treatment for skin cancer and other lung diseases. So this is not something new that we just discovered. Um, and as for the virus itself, coronaviruses, scientists have been studying this for over 50 years. So this, we, within 10 days of the first case being diagnosed, scientists already figure out the genomic sequence of this virus. So um, the world as we know it in 2020, our top priority is coronavirus, is fighting the pandemic. So all the scientists around the world got together and this is a worldwide collaboration. Funding became av available, large scale trials became available and that's how a vaccine can be developed in such an accelerated time period. Next. So this is, it took me a while to even understand this, but this is pretty much the, how the mRNA vaccine works. It's a protein that gives your body instruction on how to build immunity. And it's like the invisible ink on your cell phone. Once you see the message, once your body learns it, it disappears. This doesn't get incorporated into your DNA. This, this mRNA in, from the vaccine disappears, but your body now learns to have the antibody. And in the future, if, if your body sees this virus, it will have the memory to fight off the infection. Next. So who all participated in the study? Um, between the two trials, there were over 74,000 participants from all over the world. This is again, it's a worldwide collaboration and you can see how many clinical sites are involved with this. Um, in the US, there were close to 40 um, different sites and you can see there's a good distribution of racial and ethnic distribution um, in terms of participants and also a dif distribution in terms of age as well. Next. So everything we learn in school, um, the first thing that th they taught us is do no harm. Whatever you do, whatever fancy treatment technology you, you learn to offer for patient, the first rule in medicine is do not cause harm. Um, so let's talk about the risk versus the benefits of getting the vaccine. Yes, there are gonna be some side effects. Yes, they may have some possible severe allergic reaction. And some people said, I already had COVID. Why should I go through that again and get the vaccine? Well, let's look at the benefits. The benefit, benefits we know is the vaccine prevents severe infection. And I'll share with you some stats in, in it a little bit. It gives you the immunity to fight off the virus without you having to experience the illness. Um, it's a safer way to protect, to, to build protection and it's a safe way to protect the people around you. You may get COVID and you got over it like a flu, but as you're going through the process, you could spread it to your loved ones um, or those who are vulnerable, who have less Im Im immune system to fight off the virus. And this offers you a solution to ending the pandemic. So do you wanna be part of the solution? Um, and then the last thing about the benefit is we hear Dr. Fauci talk about this, 
um, the mutated virus. If we can vaccinate most of us fast enough that there will not be viruses around to mutate, that virus simply cannot mutate. So we have to beat them to the race. Next. Okay, so side effect. Everything we do is risk versus benefit, right? So we're trying to, so the risk, let's look at the side effects next. Um, actually, let's talk about, let's do the math first, and then we'll talk about the side effects. Um, let's do the math. We've seen the numbers, how many people, we just unfortunately hit the half a million um, mark for how many people died in the U.S., and look at total cases, 28 million cases in the US. This is you know, cumulative since the pandemic started last year. Let's look at this table. And I thought it was very fascinating. It's a big zero. So these are the five trials and how many people were participated in the trial and zero person was hospitalized after fully vaccinated or died from it or died from the vaccine. So we know based on the data on real people that this is 100% effective at preventing death or serious illness. And as for the vaccine related severe allergic reaction in the study, they, they were 11 cases, 11 per million people. So it's a no brainer. And there's less than 1% of adverse events reported. Next. So yes, so now let's talk about the side effects, right? So there's no free lunch. Um, you, most people get pain and swelling in the arm. So just don't go lifting and you know get the vaccine on the side you don't sleep on. Um, some people may develop flu-like symptoms, the fever, the body ache. Um, and this may be an excuse for you to just stay in bed and rest a little bit. Usually it comes on about within a day or two after the vaccine and it goes away after a few days, two to three days. Um, the side effect may be more pronounced in the younger population. And I won't tell you what age young is these days because um, yeah. And usually it's more pronounced with the second dose. So, um, but on the other end, some people don't have any side effect and that doesn't mean the vaccine isn't working. So. It's a spectrum. Next. Some, and, and this is taken from the ACIP, um, just kind of breakdown of side effects. Some people do experience fever. So about 10% of people will get fever after the second dose. And, um, but again, these are common side effects that are predictable. Next. So this is the question I get again. Is a glass half empty or glass half full? Now that you're fully vaccinated, what's next? Does that mean I can throw away my mask and go party? Um, not really, not just yet. The, um, there, you should not change your behavior after the vaccine. You still have to do all the public health measures. And, and the reason for this is there's still ongoing studies. We're studying to see if the vaccine can actually stop the spread. We know the vaccine stops you from feeling really, really sick and or stops you from being hospitalized, but we don't know if it stops you from carrying the virus to give it to other people. So give us a little bit more time. And also there's uncertainty about the mutated variants and how the vaccine works. So just keep your mask on for just a tiny bit longer. Um, next. Um, one thing I do want to say is this is like the layers of protection. The vaccine offers you one more layer of protection. So let's play a game of Pictionary, right? You get, you install a fence, you put a door on, you buy an alarm system, an expensive alarm system to prevent burglar. Does that mean after you install your alarm, you take your fence down, you take your door down, you keep your door on lock? No, you do all that to keep yourself safe. So the vaccine is the same thing. It's just one more layer of protection so you can be safe and you can protect your loved ones. Next. Um, there's some myths out there that I just wanna put out there. And I know there's a lot of Q and A's at the end as well. So I hope this will address some of that. Next. 
What about the mutated variants? We keep hearing about the UK variant. We keep hearing about the South African variants. Both the Pfizer and the Moderna did put out statements stating that these vaccines are effective against the variants. Um, it may be less protection for the South Africa variant, but it still has some. It, it took from maybe 90% effective vaccine against a wild type down to 50. But let me let you in on a secret. Flu vaccines are usually 30, 40% um, uh, effective, but we take it every year because it lowers your overall risk. And then you hear about, you know, the different variant, the Big Bear, all the other variants. We are still studying the significance of them. So this is not a reason to not get the vaccine um, because there are more variant. Again, this is a race. We have to vaccinate faster, then the viruses mutate. So for all the type A people out there who want to get that gold medal, this is a race. Thank you. Um, next. Maybe I'll get the vaccine next month. Y'all go get the vaccine first. And I just now wait until more people get it. So a lot of people say that to me. Like I said earlier, 74,000 people participated in the trial before the FDA even said, yes, you can give it to anybody. But, and now over 50 million doses have been given in the US. How much longer do you wanna wait? Mm -hmm. um, so don't procrastinate. Next. Well, I already had the COVID. I took three weeks off. Do I really need to get my vaccine? The answer is yes. The immunity, the protection the vaccine offers you is longer lasting and it may be protecting you against the mutated variant. So once your doctor said you're no longer infectious, you can go out to the world, step up and get vaccinated. Next. Wow, infertility, cancer, we don't know. This is a mRNA vaccine. Is it going to mess with your DNA? No, it's like the invisible ink on your cell phone, like I said earlier. Once your body sees the message, it disappears. And in fact, there were more people who got pregnant during in the treatment trial, in the trial, people who got the vaccine than the placebo. So, hey, next. Um, allergy, okay. allergy, allergic reaction is a concern. People who have history of allergy to environmental, um, environmental stimulants to food, nuts, allergy. The only group of people that should not get vaccinated are the ones who have allergies to the components in the vaccine. And you can Google the components in a vaccine, but there's no, there's no nuts, there's no grass, there's no um, venom in these vaccines. Some people have unclear allergic reactions. So after the dose, we do monitor you for 15 minutes to make sure you don't develop any allergic reaction. And most of the allergic reaction happen within the first 30 minutes of the shot. So if you have um, serious of allergic reaction, make sure you discuss with your physician and discuss with the providers at the vaccine site. And we will monitor you for 30 minutes um, after the dose to make sure everything goes well. Next. Okay, which vaccine is the best? Now that we have all of these, the, the sky is the limit, right? The vaccine that is the best, I'm gonna let you in on a secret, is the one that is available to you. The analogy I give is, you're, it's pouring rain. Your roof is leaking. Are you going to grab the closest bucket to you? Or are you gonna wait for Amazon to deliver your gold-plated bucket? Of course, you're gonna grab the one that's closest to you to catch the rain. So get vaccinated when it's your turn because it will save life. Thank you. I think that's all I have. Dr. Wang, that was amazing. I love science, but for people who don't love science, you made it so understandable and just wonderful. Thank you. And I would just add a quick anecdote. Um, both of my parents who are 74 received their second vaccine on Monday. My dad had absolutely no symptoms. On Tuesday, my mom had uh, mild ch uh, chills and a slight fever. As of yesterday, she feels great. My mother-in-law had hers yesterday. She is 83 and has had no symptoms.
Uh, and it's just great. The more people we can get vaccinated, the better we can do and get on to our normal life or a life where we get to see each other more, which will be yeah. wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Wang. That was wonderful. Now we're going to move into questions and we are going to start with Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Senator. And yes, Dr. Wang, that was wonderful. I, it was entertaining, but very educational. Thank you. Uh, here's a common question. I'm going to ask Andrew Goldfrank. Uh, when, I, when will I get the COVID vaccine? How can the community know when they are eligible? And how can people sign up for the vaccine? Yeah, Assembly Member, that's a, a fantastic question and absolutely one that is asked all the time. And Right now, the, the answer is, it's actually, the, the answer's changing. So when we first started to roll out the vaccination and very focused on the, the, the first year, the, the healthcare workers, we were, the, the county sites were using a registration system called PrepMont. Um, we then created a, a link on our website, primarily for those 65 and older to sign up. Uh, to be notified when it was their turn or when they were able to, to get a vaccination. As we transition to my turn, which we talked about earlier in the presentation, one of the great things and, and great benefits to the my turn system is the very first two questions it asks you is about eligibility for the vaccine. So are you within the phases that we are currently vaccinating uh, residents to? If the answer is yes, you're able to register right then and there. And what's beautiful, and, and I know one of the challenges and frustrations that we've had in the past, is people would have to go through four or five pages of registration only to find out that the site was full. Yes. My turn flips that around. So first point is if you are eligible, fantastic. We're gonna move you into the, the next page on, on the registration uh, on through my turn. Then it's gonna have you select the appointment. So you'll know that you have your appointment, the location, and the time. And then it'll go through the registration components. So you're not wasting time on the registration if the, if the uh, particular clinic is, is full. In addition, within my turn, if you are not eligible yet, so let's say you are, you know, 45 years old and we're not in that phase yet and you're, you're relatively healthy. When you go to sign up on my turn and you, you click that you're not in one of those categories, you have the opportunity to register to be notified when it's, when it's time for, uh, for you to get vaccinated. And then whether it be through text or through email, um, you'll be notified through the my turn system as we come close to opening up for, for that phase. You know, I, I've got to say that um, all of us have experienced, I know super and Senator, we've received countless calls since the beginning of this. And um, I, I do want to give a shout out to the supervisor. When my staff called him and his staff, um, he didn't just say, we'll get back to you when we hear something else. He got the answers for, for my team so that my team could then give the answers to the constituents. That makes a difference uh, because people want to know when their turn is and what to expect. So, and then now with the mobile um, vaccination units, I mean, I'm just really excited about that, especially for our seniors. So thank you so, so much for that answer. And our next question is also to you, Andrew. And along those same lines, the community is wondering what is the next phase that will start in the county? Thank you very much, Senator. So as I mentioned earlier, we are currently in phase 1B tier one, which is right now open for 65 and older emergency service workers and educators. On March 15th, we're going to continue to expand the general population to those individuals 16 to 64 with underlying medical comorbid conditions that are put, up, that put them at high risk. And then in addition, we'll, we'll soon uh, in the coming weeks, We'll be opening up uh, tier one further to those in the food and agriculture uh, industry. So that will be the next phase uh, within uh, the county distribution before we move further into uh, phase one B tier two. That's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Goldfrack. And uh, next we have a community question for Dr. Wang. 
Uh, and the question, actually two questions. Can a person be uh, vaccinated for COVID, still be a carrier? And can you still spread COVID after getting the vaccine? Um, <clears throat> so yes, it's, it's possible. Um, we're, there's still more post tri vaccine trials that are, st um, the companies are studying this to see if you can be a carrier. The risk of you getting COVID is much, much lower. So it makes sense that you would not catch the catch COVID after you get vaccinated, but it's too early to say, absolutely, you're not gonna get COVID, you're not gonna spread it. And that's why we continue to wear our mask. Appreciate it, Dr. Wang. Thanks for your great response. Thank you. Um, thank you. I can tell you we're not going to get to all of our questions. So I'm going to tell the senator and the supervisor to start looking at the questions, see which one you're going to be asking next, because there is no way we'll get to all the questions. But but here's one. Um, it, it, we know that the, the vaccine comes from the federal government to the state uh, or, or to the counties at this point. Um, how is it that the, the, with the uh, with a third party administrator, um, Blue Shield, how will the county get uh, and the county medical facilities get their doses so that they can then distribute them? Sure, so great, great question. And, and we're still working closely with Blue Shield to finalize th those answers. So as you mentioned, currently the, the county gets its allocation to the state um, after the, the state has allocated to multi-county entities, you know, large health systems, and some of the federal partnerships. Um, we're working with uh, Blue Shield to identify um, all the, the different providers. So whether it be a county provider or one of the 245 uh, partners that we have in, uh, in, in play already, where Blue Shield will directly align the allocation and the distributions um, to those providers. And that's gonna be in partnership with the county on focusing on equity, focusing on distribution, on utilization. Um, so in other words, if we have uh, two, two different providers that are in the exact same market, but one is able to do a thousand a day and one's able to do 20 a day, we're gonna you know, err on the side of going to the, the thousand a day if it's in that same market. However, we're very much focused also on equity and really ensuring that doses are, are brought to the areas where they're at most risk. So if you have that provider, that same scenario where one's 500 and one's you know, 20 or, or 100, but that's in an underserved population, we're gonna make sure that that 20 and 100 gets the, the doses to be able to help serve that, that underserved populations. So they, they've committed to us that they're gonna work very closely with the county to determine that health equity and determine that distribution model. I, I thank you for the answer. I, I can tell you that that has been one of the biggest issues. And Dr. Wang talked about 50% of the deaths and the hospitalizations being Latino, yet Latinos are not 50% of the population. Um, it, it, it's, it's something that should be alarming to all of us, and I know that it is. Um, we're hearing the statistics about who's being vaccinated, who is not being vaccinated, and Equity is something the governor has talked about. I have heard all of you talk about it. Um, I know that at the state, we all talk about it. And just putting it into practice is the most important. So I appreciate the county's efforts in the, the issue of equity. Thank you. All right, this is a question two, I'm gonna sneak them in for uh, Director Porter. Director Porter, um, people in the community are wondering if they cannot get out for a vaccine, if their condition stops them from going to a location or a drive up, is there a way for them to get vaccinated at their home? And additionally, I have seen in other counties that they have a standby line or list. Are we doing that in San Bernardino County? Thank you, Senator, for both those questions. Uh, for the first one, we have started, as was mentioned, the, the mobile clinics or the mobile vaccination teams. The plan is, is to continue for those teams to outreach into the community and to start visiting uh, those sites where seniors may be uh, located in large numbers 
And slowly but surely, as we build more teams, we will get to more of the individuals as well, but we'll focus on the larger populations. First, there's housing and complexes like that that house a lot of seniors. So we're trying to get there first and spread it out throughout the 20,000 square miles of this, this wonderful county. So more to come on that, but yes, we are focusing. We are aware of that population. It's very concerning to us that we may have some homebound seniors that cannot get out, cannot get access, and they may not have the family support to assist them. Obviously, if they do have family support, we'll encourage the family to really help them to meet that need. On the second question, I love this question. So we do not want to waste a single dose. And so you saw how many providers we have in the county. So we aren't prescriptive about um, uh, formulating a list on their behalf, but we do encourage each provider to provide or develop a list so that they do not waste vaccines. We encourage them to follow the state tiering structure. So if they don't have someone in the existing tier, that, then they can reach down to the food and egg and uh, bring somebody in that would uh, be able to use that dose so it doesn't get wasted. So we have encouraged all of our uh, providers to do that, to take that approach, so not a single dose is wasted. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Corwin, for that response. And just you know, to kind of follow up on that, the, the great thing about some of our drive-through vaccinations that the county has provided is that you see many grandchildren and children actually driving seniors through so they get to sit in the comfort of the car with their family. So I think that's a, it's a great option. So uh, thank you for uh, that response. Uh, one of the things I wanna ask a question is, you know, everybody's asking, when am I next? When am I next? So the question is, you know, if I'm 64 years of age of under, because people wanna know when it's their turn, they know that seniors and many other groups are getting it. So my question is, when will someone under the age of 65 be able to get their vaccine? So I think it, it's gonna depend. And so if they're under 65 and they've got comorbid conditions um, that put them at high risk, then March 15th will be that day. If they are 64 or under and they are in good health, um, those phasing and that timeline is still being worked out um, at the state. Um, what, you know, so then the, the, you'd have to kind of bring it down to another level to say, what industry are they in? And are they in food and ag, which would mean in the next, you know, in the coming weeks. If they're in um, other, some of the other industries that we've that have been identified by CDPH as essential workers, that's listed out. Otherwise, it's gonna really fall just under kind of a general age distribution. And that information is still being uh, worked on, you know, with CDPH. In, in partnership with uh, the CDC um, at, at the state level. So um, more to come on that. Appreciate it. Thank you for the response, Mr. Goldfrack. Thank you. I, um, here's another question so, uh, similar to what the supervisor is asking about. This is someone who says, how soon will my wife who's a diabetic, uh, but not over 75, and I think that the answer is March 15th, um, they, they, they will be eligible. But here's another question similar to that, and that is, perhaps Dr. Wang, this would be for you. Why aren't we immunizing entire families? If we do just one person in that household and not the caretaker, um, then the caretaker can still, there's still the problem there. Uh, is there, I know at the state level, we've had lots of discussions about this, but what is the benefit to doing the entire family? And is that something that perhaps there can be more discussion about. I think it also goes back to supply issue. And that's why supply and, you know, targeting the highest risk population right now. Um, I mean, if we have ample supply, you know, in my opinion, everybody should be vaccinated, but we have to adhere to the tier system so we can prioritize those that are affected the most and, and, and go from there. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Goldfrack, I'm going to ask you a question that I just received via text message. Uh, so if you don't know the answer, that's okay. Uh, but wondering when, and these are people that I used to represent, wondering, wondering when grocery workers will be able to get vaccinated uh, and our drugstore workers. So grocery workers are in that food and agriculture group. Okay. So that will be in, in the coming weeks. We'll in like two weeks? Ish. 
Okay. Um, and it, I love the word ish, but ish. And that's because it really depends on the allocations that, we're, that we have coming into the, into the county. That's been our single limiting factor. We are seeing promise and we are seeing more and more week over week coming in. But for on average, we see around 20,000 doses total for the county every week. Um, that's not a lot of doses to go around when you, when you look at our population. So we hope that it's sooner than later, but it really depends on how appointments are going with the populations that are already open in our, in our tiers and, and our phase structure. So uh, I'm hoping you know, in, in a few weeks um, that we'll be able to open up to, to the, that food and agriculture group. Great, thank you for that. Um, you know, we know that our grocery workers have been there every single day since the pandemic started, making sure we all have what we need for our families. So I just wanna put in a plug for them to get vaccinated. Thank Absolutely. you. Yeah, thank you, and uh, I have a question, I guess. You know, one of the concerns is uh, as, as a former teacher and educator is like, you know, when are schools going to be able to go back? Um, I know that teachers and administrators and site staff are getting vaccinated. So I guess my question is, when, when will schools be able to open up here locally? I'll let uh, Corwin uh, respond to that one. My pleasure. So the good news is K through six has the ability to open now. Obviously, that'll be a local decision between the districts and their boards. Well, we're predicting that um, we will get to that seven case rate later this in the month of March. That will allow grades seven through 12 that same opportunity. So we're watching that case rate descent very, very closely, anticipating that we'll get to that red tier. And then we will see movements, not just in the schools, but also in some of the businesses and other sectors too. So that's, it'll be an exciting time when we can get to that seven case rate, see the high schools, middle schools open and move into that next phase that we're all anxious to get to in our, in our communities and in our, in our economy. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Porter. And I know that's been a challenge for many families. Socially, you've had many single mothers that have had to stay home with their, uh, their children because they've been able to work because of having to stay home with distance learning, but appreciate that response. Thank you so much. I, I can tell you that um, with Senator Leva as chair of the Education Committee in the Senate, and with so much work being done, I know hopefully on Monday we'll be able to vote on something if once we have an agreement, uh, the Senate and the Assembly have agreed uh, to most of the terms and now the, the, um, the discussions with the, with the administration have been very productive and hopefully by Monday, um, if not, then it'll be Thursday. We will be able to vote on something um, uh, to, to provide the necessary resources also for our schools to open for those who decide to open. Uh, there's a lot of money that will be made available because it's not going to be an easy transition, but it's an excellent question, Supervisor. Well, we, we clearly did not get to all of the questions but we tried to get through as many as we could. Uh, to the community, I want you to know that we're still available. At the end of, of the session today, you're going to see the phone numbers for the Senator, for the Supervisor, for my office, and also for the County. Do reach out to us. Uh, we want to thank all of our guests and for the community also for joining us today. Without a doubt, these are uncertain times that we're living in and as your representatives, we want to do and we must do our best to bring as much transparency and information as possible. And we believe the best way to do this is by providing useful information for you and your family and listening to your concerns. And this is why today we did this town hall. Senator Leva, some closing comments. Thank you very much, Madam Majority Leader. Uh, this was wonderful. Uh, really thank all of our participants. And this is how we get better, right? When we have the information, when we understand the science. So I'm just gonna ask and remind everybody to wear their mask, socially distance, wash your hands, because as Dr. Wang said, even once you're vaccinated, we still have to continue to wear those masks. And I wanna say that we are that close to a deal on reopening schools, which is super, super exciting. And uh, we'll know more uh, 
hopefully in the coming hours. But thank you for everyone who has participated for all that you're doing and for everybody listening. Thank you for what you're doing because you're not just keeping yourself safe, but you're keeping your community safe. We can survive this, we can do this and come out better on the other side. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Reyes, for the opportunity to be here and participate in this panel. I want to thank the panelists and Senator Connie Leba for your leadership in uh, Sacramento. We just want to share some information with you. What the county has done is uh, we're, we'll be partnering with the congregations organized for prophetic engagement to cope in the Inland Empire concerned African American churches uh, for vaccination mobile pop up clinics in African American congregations. Uh, we talked about equity. And just to kind of give you an update, some of the areas where we'll be having some of these, we'll be entering agreements for vaccination sites, uh, New Life Christian Church in Fontana, uh, Juniper Avenue SDA Church in Fontana, uh, Life Changing Ministries in San Bernardino, Ecclesian Christian Fellowship uh, in San Bernardino, uh, Transformation Church in the uh, city of Chino. And a couple areas we'll be having pop-up centers is in uh, Muscoy, uh, February 26th from 10 to 2. So there's 100 appointments available. And also on March 1st in the city of Colton at the Hutton Senior Center from 10 to 2, uh, we'll also have appointments available. Please call our uh, Joint Information Center or known as the JIC at area code 909-387-3911. And it was talked about by Dr. Wang earlier is if you don't have the technology to do it, find a loved one or someone that can walk you through the process, make the phone call for you, register for you online. Those are important uh, things to do because I think at the end of the day, it was mentioned we want to open up schools. I believe we want to get our economy going to revitalize the uh, state of California. But most of all, we want to be safe and be with our loved ones. I think that's a challenging thing for people of color. Uh, we like to gather. It's part of our culture, our nature, and human nature. So we're looking forward to things getting better, but we need your help. Do your part. Get your vaccine when it's available. And uh, God bless all of you. And thank you, Assemblymember Reyes, for the invitation. Thank you so much. Just hearing about all of these places that are going to have the vaccine available just warms my heart because that's exactly the kind of information people want and people need. They need to know that we're all on top of it. And supervisor, I just, again, uh, my hat's off to you because the work that you've done, because you represent my community, uh, the work that you are doing is um, commendable. And I thank you and I thank your team. And again, I want to thank all of our guests. Um, I, until we have our next Teletown Hall, Please, as Senator Leva said, stay home, wash your hands, wear a mask, don't touch your face. Uh, if you're gonna be in public, do wear the face covering, check in on your loved ones, check in on your neighbors, do everything that you can because we will get through this together. Again, thank you all. 